Good evening and welcome to the Spring Hill broadcast. Thank God for you joining us here tonight. Please hit a thumbs up, like and subscribe on whatever platform you're joining us from. Listen, if you're joining us from somewhere around the Gainesville region, state of Florida, somewhere around the United States or around the globe, do know that we have prayed for, planned for, and prepared for the opportunity to share in the Word of God together. And we're praising God that we have this chance to worship Him. Uh, let's look to the Lord for a moment of uh, prayer. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Father, we thank you so very much for your gracious love and kindness that you've shown to us today. We thank you that we are yours. We are not just your crea creation, but we are your children, uh, those that have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we are so grateful for your grace and we're grateful for you watching over us, protecting us and providing for us. Now, Father, we thank you for your holy word, your word that gives us an opportunity to understand you, worship you and to uh, have relationship with you uh, through the truth of your divine word. Father, we're praying now that you would open our minds and help us to understand, soften our hearts and help us to receive, transform us by the power of the gospel, save, sanctify and strengthen us all through your holy word. These are your servants prayers in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us for another, uh, the last lesson that I'll teach regarding the doctrine of the Lord Jesus Christ. We've been studying over the last four weeks uh, the truths about who Jesus is. He is more than just a moral teacher. He's more than just a good person. He is the Son of God, the very express image of God, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died a sacrificial death and was raised powerfully from the grave and is now seated at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us as our soon to come Savior or, or soon to come uh, Lord. And uh, ultimately to this earth, he'll be the soon to come King. So we've been learning and studying and digging into the truths of who Jesus is as Christian believers that are part of the local New Testament church, it is critically important that we understand who Jesus is. He's not the man upstairs. He's not just a good person. He is not a God. He is the very son of God. He's not even a son of God. He is the son of God that was born in this world in order that he may reconcile us, bring us back together with God through himself. We're looking tonight at the work of Christ. Our lesson will center around the work of Christ, the work of Christ. Uh, George Terrell uh, in England, who was a courageous uh, proponent of the truth and uh, one that taught the word of God, was expelled from the Jesuit order. And uh, in the midst of his troubles, he said again and again, I have been tempted to give up the struggle, but always that strange man hanging on the cross, sends me back to my tasks again. We're going to talk tonight about that strange man and his work in our life, the Lord Jesus Christ. Number one, the Lord Jesus Christ, the resurrection of Christ. Number one is the resurrection of Christ, the resurrection of Christ. What is its impact? What is its import in the life of the believer? Christ's resurrection is his triumph uh, over death and uh, it confirms his power and his authority over sin and mortality. And it offers to us our hope for eternal life. We must be clear on the understanding that Christ did not swoon. He didn't pass out on the cross. He died on the cross. Uh, and uh, understanding that is essential as we work to understand that Christ not only uh, died from a physical uh, death, died a spiritual death, died a judicial death, died an intense death. He died an atoning death on the cross. And that is critical for us to understand. That statement that I made about him not swooning or passing out was because there are some that suggest and say that Christ did not actually die, but rather that he uh, simply uh, got into a very uh, low state and uh, uh, did not die, but passed out on the cross. Well, if that were the case, uh, then that means he wasn't dead. And when they put him in the grave, that he simply woke up to himself. That's what some people asserted and believe. But no, that's not true, friend. He died a very real death in those ways that I just mentioned. And since he died in such a powerful way, his resurrection then punctuates his supremacy 
and it shows God's holy power as Romans 1, 4 shows us. Now let's look in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 55 through 57. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 55 through 57. Uh, the great question is asked, O death, where is thy sting? And O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law, but thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ's resurrection gives us hope that death has no power over us, that our bodies may go back to the dust as has been predicted, that from the dust we came and to the dust we shall return. That's our body, but we have a spirit man that lives on the inside and, uh, and we shall be raised gloriously and victoriously uh, by the power of God. And Christ is the first prototype of that. He is the first uh, to be raised from the dead in such a way. And if we believe that Christ was raised from the dead, every time the hearse wheels roll uh, at this church is not the end of the story. Every time we have to visit uh, the cemetery is not the end of the story because we are assured of resurrection that comes through Jesus Christ. Romans chapter six, verses nine through 10 says this, Romans chapter six, verses nine through 10, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dies no more, death hath no more dominion over him. That means has no power or control over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he lives, he lives unto God. Christ is, has victory over death, and that's shown in the resurrection. But also Christ's resurrection is foundational to our faith. It is an important component to the faith that we have in God. The resurrection is central to the Christian faith, and without it, our faith would literally be in vain. It validates everything that Christ taught and everything that Christ did. Without the resurrection, Christ's death would have been simply a tragic end to the remarkable life of a magnificent moral teacher and a faith healer. But his resurrection from the grave was essential to guarantee his sufficiency in saving all humanity. First uh, Corinthians chapter 15 uh, verse 14 through 17, and if Christ be not risen, uh, then is our preaching in vain, and your faith is also in vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, and if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then uh, is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. You see how foundational Paul says uh, Christ's resurrection is to our faith? If we don't trust, believe, and put our hope in the fact that yes, he died, and he died a, a, all of those deaths that I described, physical death, spiritual death, judicial death. Uh, he died an atoning death. Uh, he died a vicarious death, a sacrificial death on the cross. Yes, he died, but died when all, if he had simply died, he would have been like the other Old Testament patriarchs who had also died. Abraham died, Isaac died, Jacob died, all the other, Moses died, Joshua died. He would have been like everybody else, but he didn't stay dead. He was raised from the grave. And that's important for us to believe as Christians that we serve a risen savior who is in the world today. And so, or, or, or who is uh, living today. So we put our hope and our trust in that. Acts chapter two, verse 32, uh, Peter's great uh, sermon, the, cow, the, the Peter who was once a coward uh, when Jesus was on the cross after seeing the resurrected savior is now a champion of that resurrected Jesus. Acts chapter two, verse 32 says, this Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses, or whereof we all are witnesses. Peter said, I'm a witness that Jesus rose. There were 500 different sightings of Jesus uh, in the New Testament after his resurrection. And it is a glorious testament to the fact that Jesus is not dead, but is alive. And that's critical for our, uh, our faith. Romans chapter 10. Verse nine says, 
that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shall be saved. Do you see how critical resurrection is to our faith? Nothing that we do, nothing that we uh, eat, no type of clothing that we wear, no type of rituals we go to are sufficient to save us. But our faith in the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ is what prompts our salvation. That's what causes us to come to belief is that Jesus was raised from the dead and trusting and believing in him uh, and his perfect work that is performed at Calvary. So it's a foundational to our faith. It gives us victory over death, but also Christ's resurrection gives us assurance of our resurrection. Christ's resurrection assures us our own of our own future resurrection. As he rose from the dead, so shall we entering into eternal life. If I believe that Jesus was raised from the dead, then I believe that one day this mortal body of mine will go back to the dust. But one day at the resurrection, when the trump of God shall sound, the Bible says the dead in Christ shall rise. As a matter of fact, let's look uh, in uh, the word of God and let's see how the word of God assures us of this. First Thessalonians chapter four, verse 14 says, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Paul is talking to the believers in Thessalonica uh, who have suffered under uh, false teaching. The false teachers have come in and told them that their hope is in vain, that uh, the resurrection has already come and gone. And so they sit out on the hillsides mourning uh, uh, the fact of, well, they, they had differing issues. So one at one point, they believed that the resurrection had, had already passed, and so they were questioning about what, what was going to happen to their loved ones because the, the graves uh, on the hillside, as they were looking, or rather the graves uh, in the cemeteries that they were looking at were still unmoved and unbothered. And so they said, well, our loved ones uh, are dead and, and there's no hope left for them. But then they sat on the hillside looking up into heaven, uh, trying to uh, wait on the return of Christ because they believed in his imminent return. And so they were just confused. And Paul had to assure them, look, don't worry about uh, those that are dead because uh, one day the dead in Christ will rise. And then those that are alive and remain shall be uh, changed in a moment and in the twinkling of an eye. Listen, friend, you and I don't have to worry that when it's getting up time, the Lord knows how to reclaim and how to gather us all. Uh, and just as God had the power to raise up Jesus, nobody uh, had done that before. Yet yeah, Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead, but Lazarus had to go back and die again. Uh, he raised up the widow's son at Nain, but uh, the widow's son had to go back and die again. But when Jesus rose from the dead, he rose and never would have to die anymore. And we will ra be raised up like the Lord Jesus Christ, glorious and victorious, never to die again. Uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 11. I'll read that in your hearing. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he that raises up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwells in you. Praise God for the assurance that we have in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. But Jesus is also working uh, in his present work. He is presently working in your life and in my life, and he's working uh, in the lives of believers today. Uh, one, number one thing that Jesus is doing is intercession. He is praying for believers. He is praying on our behalf. Christ currently serves as our great high priest, continually interceding on our behalf before the Father and advocating for us and securing our salvation. Christ's work in intercession means that guilty sinners who are saved by God's loving grace and power demonstrated by Christ's sacrificial death upon the cross now have a continual petitioner and advocate with the Father in heaven. Uh, the glorious thing about Jesus is that he didn't stop working, but he continues to work. I've taught you that the prophets of old would talk to the people on behalf of God, but the priests would go to God on behalf of the people. And we're grateful that Christ is our great high priest that uh, understands us and loves us and cares for us so much that he is right now interceding on our behalf and he's talking to our heavenly father on our behalf. Uh, Hebrews chapter seven, verse 25 says this, wherefore, 
he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing that he ever lives to make intercession for them. That means he's praying for us. First John chapter two, verse one is a glorious statement that I love so much. My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. But if any man sins, we have an advocate with the father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. You know what that uh, word advocate means? It's a it's a judicial term. It means that we have an attorney that goes before the judge on our behalf, guilty though we may be. Uh, and many of us want to claim and cry innocent. But no, the fact about it is we are guilty as charged. But I'm so glad that uh, we don't have to try to stand and defend ourselves against the accuser of the brethren, which is Satan, who is always accusing us, uh, who is always the prosecuting attorney, bringing up the charges and saying, God, look at what Adrian did this time. Look at what Adrian has done this time. And then also remember all the previous things that Adrian has done, even though Satan is doing that all the time. I'm so glad that I have an advocate. I've got a defense attorney that's always standing before the heavenly father and saying, yes, he did all of those things, but God, I paid the price for his sins. And so thank God that I have that. And you have that Romans 8, 34, Romans chapter eight, verse 34 says, who is, uh, who he is he that condemns? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Christ is right now praying for you. He's right now praying for me. And I'm so grateful for that. So his intercession is part of his work, but also he empowers believers through the Holy Spirit. He's working and empowering us. He's given us the strength we need, the, the grace we need, the power we need to make it day by day. And listen, I don't know if you know it or not, friend, but you need God's holy power. Well, how is he empowering us? And what does that mean to be empowered and uh, by the Holy Spirit? It means that we're, it, we're guided by the Holy Spirit. It means that we, we know which way to go based on the Holy Spirit's prompting. We are comforted by the Holy Spirit in the midst of our struggles and trials. He comforts us and also he enables us to live out the life and the calling that God has placed on our lives in Christ Jesus. We couldn't do anything uh, in the spiritual realm. We couldn't do anything uh, for God if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit that was giving us the power in order to do it. John chapter 16, verse number seven says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Thank God that Jesus went away and sends us the comforter. The, the challenge with uh, uh, us understanding that is because we would say, wouldn't it be better to have Jesus? Well, understand in his earthly body, he was unipresent. He, he could only be present in one place at the same time, physically, physically, because he was in a physical human body. But when he goes away and sends the third person of the triunity of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit can be everywhere. Uh, amen. Can, can, can be in the hearts and, and lives of, his, of God's holy people and of the saints can be everywhere, can be everywhere. And so the, the Spirit is here with me in Gainesville. He's, he's with uh, friends in Gainesville, uh, and I'm talking in Gainesville, Florida. He's with friends in Gainesville, Texas. Friends, uh, uh, he's with our friends in Gainesville, Georgia, wherever. He is everywhere, giving strength, grace, and guidance to all that need. He empowers us. Acts chapter 1, verse number 8 gives us this demonstration. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be my witnesses unto uh, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and even unto the uttermost parts of the earth. The only way that's able to happen, the only way we can be witnesses telling people that the Lord Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried, and three days later God raised him from the dead, the way that happens is we are empowered, we're quickened, we're stirred up by the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter number three, verses 16 and 17 says this. Ephesians chapter three, verses 16 and 17, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with 
uh, might by his spirit in the inner man, in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that you being rooted and grounded in love. You know what that means? That means that he's going to stand you up, prop you up and hold you up on every side so that when the winds and storms of life want to beat you down, the Holy Spirit will straighten you up, strengthen you and uh, keep you keep you going strong. So we thank God that Christ is working, empowering us. You, you and I couldn't make it if the Holy Ghost uh, and, and the power of Christ was not strengthening us and helping us to go along the way. But this is another one that I love. Christ is working and he is operational in building his church. He is working and operational and active, actively building his church. Christ is actively involved in building and purifying his church, nurturing it as a community of believers united together in faith and purpose. This is what Jesus said, Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. And I say unto you, Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. And I say unto you that thou Peter, that thou art Peter and upon this rock. Listen, this is Jesus talking. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The church is not the design of man. The church is the design of of Christ. Furthermore, the church is not the, in the care of men. It is in the care of the Lord Jesus Christ. He allows us and brings us into the opportunity to serve along with him and grants us the grace to come alongside and, and to partner with him in the work of the church. But ultimately, it is the responsibility of the Lord Jesus Christ to build the church. Don't ever think that church is insignificant. Don't ever let anybody tell you that church is the design of man in order to manipulate the masses. Not true. Matthew 16, 18 says very clearly that Jesus said upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now you need to be careful because I do understand that not all churches are equal. The devil has some churches just like the Lord has some churches. So in, under, in order to understand the difference, you've got to uh, you've got to evaluate correctly and uh, uh Clearly, uh, the difference between the, the, the two. Uh, first Peter chapter two, verse four and five says, first Peter chapter two, verse four and five says to whom coming as unto a living stone disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious ye. He's talking to the church also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices. That's our purpose. That's our aim. That's our focus. That's our goal to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Christ is actively working in order to build up his church for the purpose of sharing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and offering the sacrifices of our lives unto him, to his honor and his glory. Many people have corrupted and tried to use the church for different means, methods and modes but the Lord's local New Testament church has one focus and aim, and that is to lift up the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and to call a dying world to a living Savior who, remember, we told you he's not dead, but Jesus is alive and well. So that's the work of Christ uh, currently in our lives, the present work of the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives. But what is the future work of the Lord Jesus Christ? What is he going to do in the future? Well, one we're looking for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ in glory. Christ will return one day in glory and it will be a momentous event anticipated by believers when he will establish his kingdom fully and righteously. The Lord's work is yet uh, to accomplish his return and kingdom and Christ is coming one day for his saints. Acts chapter one, verse 11 prompts us to have a uh, an anticipation of the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what, what does that mean? Let me unpack that. It means that at any second now, at any moment, Jesus could crack the sky, stand on the cloud, and rapture and call the church of God home. That, uh, that which I talked about earlier in the resurrection section, uh, the dead in Christ will rise, and we that are alive and remain will be caught up and changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, 
every New Testament believer should be living their lives in anticipation that Jesus could come at any second. That means we want to be found ready when the Lord comes and, uh, and we need to recognize that he can come at any time. So we don't want to put off doing things uh, for tomorrow that we should do today. We don't want to put off putting away sin from our lives that we should do today because Jesus could come just like that. Acts chapter one, verse 11 uh, says this, <clears throat> which also said, ye men from Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into the heavens for this same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Jesus is coming again imminently. Matthew chapter 24, verse 30 says, and then shall appear the sign of the son of man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the son of man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. That's what God's holy word said. Then Revelation chapter one, verse seven said, behold, he comes with clouds and every eye shall see him and they also which pierced him and all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. And then when you go to the end of Revelation, Jesus repeats constantly, uh, behold, I come quickly. Behold, I come quickly. And finally, John couldn't take it anymore. He, he got so happy writing. He said, even so, come Lord Jesus. Listen, Jesus is coming again. The question we have to ask is, what position shall we be found in? Shall we be found as the family and children of God or, or shall we be found as those that have rejected the Lord Jesus Christ? Then uh, Jesus will work in the future in judgment of the world, in judgment of the world. And many people don't like this particular thought. Uh, as a matter of fact, people have worked to water down the Bible and have worked uh, in different transliterations uh, and in different modifications of the Bible to cast away all thought about judgment because they don't like this idea of a judge. But Jesus will one day come and judge. First, uh, Second Corinthians chapter five, verse 10 says, for we must also appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive of the things done in the body according to that which he has done. Jesus is coming again to judge, but then not only that, to establish uh, a new heaven and a new earth. The fact about it is this earth has been corrupted. It has been tainted by sin and the results of sin. But one day John looked in Revelation chapter 21 verses 1 through Four and says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Friend, Jesus will one day after the judgment and after everything is settled, he'll give a new heaven and a new earth that has not been touched by sin. Jesus is at work right now. My question is to me, Adrian, will you let him work in your life? My question is to you, my friend, will you let the Lord Jesus work in your life as well? God bless you. I pray you'll share your faith with someone and let them know that Jesus died for their sins, was buried and God raised him from the dead. I'll see you on Sunday.